Good to see all of you. We, uh, I want to spend t- the next two weeks uh, in our series on the Holy Spirit talking about what does the voice of the Holy Spirit sound like? It's a very important question. We, we wrestle with it all the time internally. We hear people talk about how they heard the Lord speak to them or, or we'll hear statements in church or we'll hear Christians say or we'll even sing songs that say, yeah, God led me here. And, and there seems to be this this ability that certain Christians have or that, that the Bible talks about where we're able to discern God's voice in our own mind as we navigate our thoughts, there's a way that the Spirit speaks to us. And this is a really important zone uh, for us to talk about. Uh, it's very critical to, to begin to understand as I engage my thought life and my heart life, what does God's voice sound like in the midst of that, because there's all kinds of thoughts that we'll think, and we have a hard time discerning. Was that God's voice telling me to do that, or was that just my own self saying that? Was that actually the evil one talking? And so it's a very critical subject, uh, and, and we can't exhaust it even in two weeks. But, but Paul, as we move through Romans 8, he's, he's turning to that subject matter, and he, and he does this very intentionally. He's trying to get this Roman church to really understand what it means to be led by the Spirit. Which means they have to be able to hear his voice and know what his voice sounds like. So he's going to give them some very plain instruction about how to know what the Spirit is saying and what he actually says. It's very clear in Scripture and sometimes uh, this can be really obscure for us. But hopefully we'll, we'll be a little bit more clear after these two weeks in terms of how to discern the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 5 tells us that it's the mark of a mature person to be able to discern between good and evil. And so part of Christian maturity is not just being able to check things off a list and say that you've done these things, but it actually, in real time, is able to, a, a, a mark of maturity is in your own brain, distinguish, but was that a thought of the spirit or was that a thought of the flesh? Was that, was that my own thought? Was that the thought of the evil one? And being able to, to discern that rightly is a great mark of Christian maturity. And so my hope is, is that... Uh, we'll have more confidence in our ability to discern the Spirit's voice in our lives. And again, I'm not talking, uh, we, we obviously know the Spirit's voice in one sense because we have the Bible. This is God's word and the Spirit wrote this and he's speaking these words to us and we can access those words at any moment, fortunately, in our culture. Uh, and so we have this great ability to hear from the Spirit through the scriptures, but we're talking more about this this internal and relational dialogue that is available to us as people who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. This is going to lead us today to talk about the discipline of celebration. We, what we want to do after we look at Romans 8 is, is, is uh, articulate this discipline of celebration and then have a time in our service where we sing and we have a time of celebration. So if you could put the number on the screen, what, what I want you to do while I'm talking is I give you permission to not pay attention to what I'm saying after what I'm about to say. Text this number. It's the number for the new Cardinals head coach. And we can, you know, uh, this is a number that that will go up to the booth upstairs and they'll type out the answer so we can display them during our worship time. The answer to this question, how has God shown his goodness to you? How has he shown his goodness to you? It can be in the last six months. It can be at some point in your life. How has he shown his goodness to you? And then we'll put those up on the screen uh, during our response time and worship time after the, the sermon is over. So we'll leave that number up all service. You can have your phone out and you can text and then you can tune me out because no one will judge you for having your phone out. Oh, they're texting. They're spiritual. You're just playing Angry Birds or something. I don't know. But um, there's the number. And uh, uh, we'll talk about the significance of that as we, as we wrap up our time. So let's go to Romans 8. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Uh, let, let me pray. <clears throat> Spirit, we want to we be able to discern your voice. Teach us what your voice sounds like in very simple ways today. I pray that you would remove all the other voices that are, that are distracting us from you. Cancel the noise. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I'm going to start in verse 12. Our focus will be... 14 through 17, but let's, let's start in verse 12. So then, brothers, 
We're not debtors, or we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. We owe nothing to the flesh. We can say no to sin. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you'll live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So Paul has continued to articulate that we have a new relationship with God. It's not centered. We don't, we don't primarily have then, our, our relationship with God is not just a list of sins to defeat. But what a relationship with God is, is a new life, a new way of, of existing and being in relationship with him. And yes, there's sin to deal with, and yes, there's things that we need to do, but it's primarily what Paul is, is trying to activate for people is that there's, there's this there's this new life of being led by the Holy Spirit on a moment-by-moment basis, day by day. And that's the kind of relationship that we're after. That's what we're, we're trying to articulate and pursue in this series. And, and really what, what our goal is as believers for you and for me is to have this relationship, an ongoing daily basis relationship with the Holy Spirit. That, that is a huge blessing. It is something that is, is very powerful in the life of a believer. And so Paul articulates what his voice sounds like. And I want to focus uh, on verses 15 and 16, but we'll start with 17 because he has an interesting ending there. He says, as he's talked about all this life in the Spirit, he says, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. That is a surprising verse because you wouldn't expect someone to articulate all this blessing of living by the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, and then talk about suffering. We wouldn't expect that. We'd expect you live happily ever after. You'll find contentment in all things. You'll have everything work out for you. You'll experience all this healing. He says, no, that you're an heir with Christ provided that you suffer. Meaning, what, what Paul is saying is that the whole reason he's articulated all these truths is because when you follow Jesus, you are entering the family business. And you know what the family business is? Suffering for the kingdom. That's the calling that we have on our lives. And when you are adopted into God's family, you become a participant in the family business. And the family business is suffering for the sake of Christ. That's what we're doing here. And that is really hard. That's a tough pill to swallow. That's not an attractive message. There's a lot of people that reject that message. And God knows that. And so the Spirit is in our lives because of that difficulty trying to encourage us and give us assurance. That's what verse 14 through 16 are all about. And they really only come to fruition in our lives when we realize, man, this life is hard. We all know that, but it's important to name that and realize this life has intense struggles. And God knows that, and he's put his Spirit in us to speak to us in the midst of that stuff. And so we have this family business of temporarily suffering for the kingdom's advancement. Now this is in light of a future glorification that's coming and it's our great hope, but following Jesus is a difficult road and calling. So what does Paul say? How does the Spirit speak to us in the midst of it? Well, um, forget that question. We'll talk about that later. The Spirit is an internal voice that tells us two important truths. First, receive God as your glad and good Father. If you're wondering what the Spirit's voice sounds like in your heart, it is a voice that is telling you to receive God as your glad and good Father. The Holy Spirit is a voice helping you receive God as your glad and good Father. Now what does this mean? What does that actually look like? Well, Paul gives some explanation, and he, he defines it by talking about the opposite of what it is. He gives the alternative voice. There in verse 15, he says, uh, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. So the spirit of adoption that we have is, is the opposite of the spirit of enslavement and fear. And so the spirit's voice is going to be the opposite of the voice of enslavement and fear. 
And these are the voices that have to do with enslavement to sin, and they're loud, and they're all in our brains. They're the voices that cry that you're worthless. They're the voices that cry that you're a screw-up, that, that uh, you will never amount to anything. It's usually based upon the voices of other people, whether that was people close to you or something that you heard from a teacher or whatever it is. Somehow, there's these voices that are shaping the view of yourself and what those are are voices of enslavement and fear. And those are the voices that tend to shape our identities. Now the whole world is locked in that type of enslavement. The whole world is locked in this way of, of being afraid and, and, and uh, enslaved to the powers of sin. The pre-Holy Spirit, you and I were enslaved to sin, totally separated from God. We were led, actually not by the Spirit, but we were led by the power of evil. And the power of evil is manipulative, it's abusive, it's deceptive, and all kinds of empty promises. And so we're destroyed by that relationship, but we're enslaved to it. And all that produces is fear and all kinds of other stuff and we can't break out of it until Jesus finds us and we're saved out of that. We've received a different spirit, not like that, Paul is saying. That voice is the one that causes all kinds of fear in your life and gets you to do all kinds of weird stuff. This has been happening since Genesis 3. Look at this. This is right after Adam and Eve ate the fruit. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking. They knew what God sounded like. And what did that cause in their lives? They heard him walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, said to him, hey, where are you? And the man said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. This is, this is where humanity is at. Now, most humans aren't going to articulate this. Some will say, I'm in outright rebellion and actually fear. I'm, I'm, I don't want anything to do with God because I'm such a screw up. It looks different in a lot of ways. But the bottom line is, is that humans, when they hear God, they turn and run. And they're stuck in fear and shame and all kinds of hiddenness. Now, when we became Christians, we did not receive that spirit. What happened when you became a Christian, when you believed in Jesus and you received the fullness of the Holy Spirit, is there was a dramatic change. We've received adoption into God's family, and we have a new father, a new home, and we are now led by the Holy Spirit, not the spirit of enslavement and fear. Amen? This might seem irrelevant, but it's evidently, this spirit of enslavement and fear is evidently a core issue in your life and in my life. Otherwise, Paul wouldn't talk about it. In other words, most of the issues that you're facing in your life, the root is actually found in Genesis 3, 8 through 10. We're stuck in some sort of cycle or shame, or we're afraid of something. We're not recognizing God for who he actually is. And that relates to most of the issues in our life. And so whatever it is that we're afraid of, it always goes back to a lack of recognition of our adoption into God's good family. When we experience salvation and a relationship with God, we haven't returned to that kind of slavery. We have a new thing happening. And it has to do with the Spirit. And, and the Spirit's voice is different than the one of fear. It's a voice that tells us to cry out to God the Father rather than hide. And so what Paul is saying here in verse 15 is it's a complete reversal of what happened in Genesis 3 and what's been on repeat in every human ever since then. Something is now different. We no longer hide. We can cry out to the Lord. And that's a radical transformation. But the Spirit's voice is the one that is calling you and helping you live a fully transparent life before the Lord. Why? Because you know he loves you in spite of your sin. He's demonstrated that. He's provided a way for the sin to be forgiven. He's, he's done all this stuff so that he could be in relationship with you. And so we don't have a spirit of fear. We actually have a spirit of transparency and, and boldness and, and one where we can actually cry out to the Lord. 
And so our motivation for decision making, our, our, our view of ourself is no longer based upon a voice of enslavement and fear. It's, it's, it's based upon the voice of the Holy Spirit, which is the spirit of adoption. And that's a powerful term. The Spirit has replaced the old spirit. And we get the spirit of adoption as sons. Uh, verse 14 says, you're sons of God, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons. And that's culturally significant because he's not just talking to men here. He's talking to this congregation. He's talking to all of us. And it's not just sons and daughters now, but it, it represents this metaphor was happening in the Roman world. It's really only men receive the full rights of adoption. So Paul is saying what you see happening in your culture where, where men are adopted into a family or boys are adopted into a family and they're given full rights and heirs, you all have received that now. You are all adopted like sons. And you are now receiving the spirit of adoption in your life. And so the spirit encourages us and strengthens us to receive and fully accept that God is our father. When we become Christians, something happens to our human spirits and the spirit begins to help us be less afraid of being in God's presence and be more drawn to his unconditional love and grace. That's why you'll hear Christians talking so much about grace. Because that's what we're drawn to. It's no longer like this in Genesis 3. It's, it's, it's different. And that's, that's exciting. That's, that's life-giving. That's, that's new. That changes everything. That changes the basis for why we make decisions. That changes everything about how you view yourself. Because it's now about what God says about you. Paul says we, it's by the Spirit that we cry. The, the Holy Spirit helps us cry out to God. He, he helps us realize that God is our Father and then relate appropriately with God our Father. He is, he is the one telling us to cry out to the Lord and then giving us the words for it is what we're going to talk about in a couple weeks when we actually talk about prayer. But he's helping us cry out to God our Father. That word Abba is an Aramaic word that just another word for, for Father. So don't get thrown off by that. Some people say it just means Daddy, but that's not really uh, what our culture means by that term. It is a term that was uh, just signified a unique relationship between a son and father. And so what we're doing, the Spirit is helping us cry out and understand that we have a unique relationship with the creator of the universe. He's our Father. And that's an amazing thing. And so what does the voice of the Spirit sound like in your life? He's the one telling you that you have a real Father. And it's the creator of the universe. And he's the one who loves you. So everything you could ever imagine from a good father, all the comfort, all the encouragement, all the support, all the presence, all that sort of stuff that has, that has let you down is now available in God. I can't think of better news to tell you today. I really can't. I hope that sits in your soul. I hope that that really is resonating with you because that, that really is a key issue for humans. So we have this, this truth that we, the Spirit's voice is helping us receive God as our glad and good Father. He knows he has to help you because it's hard to do this. And this stems from just the pain of this earth, whether it's from your earthly father, some, some sort of pain or whatever it is that you, you have in your life, it can be hard to receive God as your good and glad father, apparently. Because this is the Spirit's primary work in our lives is to help us receive him as our good and glad father. That's his, one of his primary functions in our life, according to Paul in Romans 8 here. So as you go through life, as you, as you come to these urgent situations or as you're in the mundane situations and all of that, the Spirit's voice is the one saying, hey, talk to the Lord about this. Have you talked to him? Man, I don't know what to do. My kids won't talk to me. Well, you should talk to the Lord about it and ask him for help. 
my mom's on the way to the hospital. I don't even know what's going on. I don't even know what's happening. All I know is that I'm driving to the hospital. What am I going to find? What am I going to say? What decisions do I need to make? Talk to the Lord about it. Man, I've got all these opportunities to give. I'm not quite sure what to do with my money. I'm not quite sure how much to put in savings. Uh, should I buy this? Should we go do this? Uh, talk to the Lord about it. Are you with me on this? That's the Spirit's voice in your life. And so often we think the Spirit's voice is the one that's actually the voice of the evil one. We think God is telling you, telling us, you're a screw up. You're no good. You're condemned. You're worthless. We start to think that voice is the voice of the Holy Spirit. And that is so far away from what Paul is saying in Romans 8. Are you with me on this point? I can't repeat this enough because it's so common and so difficult for us. So the Spirit is helping you receive God as your glad and good Father. This is a renewal of what happened in the garden. And this is uh, totally transformative. As you navigate your thought life, listen to the voice that is telling you to cry out to the Father. That is the Holy Spirit talking. Listen to the person who is telling you, hey, pray about this. That's the voice of the Spirit coming to you through another person. It's very simple and straightforward. Second thing that he does. Verse 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. The Spirit is an internal voice that tells us that we are children of God. Did you know that? And what this has to do, this has to do with assuring you and I of our identity. It's very similar to point number one, but there's an aspect where it's not just about our relationship to God, but it has to do with our identity as his children. The Spirit wants to reshape how you view yourself. That's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying the Spirit, what he does, his primary work is to bear witness with your internals, your spirit, that you are a child of God. So in all the stuff that you're wondering about, all the stress that you have in your life, all those sorts that you're wondering, the Spirit's voice in the midst of that is going to just be like, hey, you're a child of God. Just hold on a second. That's this voice of the Spirit. It's not one, oh, man, you really screwed up. Now you're in a real mess. What are you going to do to get out of this? Boy, you, you have really messed this up now. Boy, what are you going to do? This is just like you. You always get in these situations. We start to think that's the voice of the Holy Spirit. That's not what Paul is saying here. I can't find it anyway, and I know the Greek. The Spirit's going to say, hey, whoa, whoa. You're a child of the living God. And that's the primary identity that you have. So we're no longer slaves. We're no longer... Uh, enslaved to a bitter master of the devil, we now have a new home, a new way of existing, a new economy. And that's God's home. And I can't think of a better home to be a part of for now and all of eternity. I cannot think of a better one. It is truly amazing. It has been life-altering for me to be a part of God's family. And I forget that often. Daily, God has to remind me. This is the work of the Spirit. The Spirit's going, hey, Kyle, you are a child of God. What are you worried about? It's okay. Talk to the Lord about it. You're his child. Man, that's so helpful to hear. We can have confidence, therefore, that he hears us and does something about it. God is not a bad father. He's a good father. And so when his children cry out to him, he hears us. That's the difficulty that a lot of Christians face, is trusting that God is actually good and he's actually hearing us. That's why the Spirit has to continually remind you that you are a child of God. It's hard to believe. Because God is patient. And he answers in different ways. He's not like you and I. It's a different kind of relationship that we're in. And he's not a phone a friend. He's not a car mechanic that we finally get to have on speed dial. He's a living God. Uh, and he's very powerful. And he's a father. He's lovingly nurturing us to maturity. His goal is not just to be Mr. Fix-It. His goal is to make us more mature and to transform our hearts. 
and to help us understand the, the difference between good and evil. Paul goes on. He doesn't just say you're children of God, but what does this mean? He spends most of his time talking about how we're heirs. If children, then heirs. Heirs of God. I mean, we get to, we're, our, our inheritance is God himself and fellow heirs with Christ. The thing that we're hoping for, this kingdom that we'll live in, we're fellow heirs with Christ, which is confidently saying you will get it because Christ is already there. He's done the work to make it happen. We get to be heirs with Christ. Our our. Our uh, inheritance is sure, it is coming, there's no reason to doubt it. We are heirs with Christ. Our indwelling of the Holy Spirit is not just something to make us feel good and to to remind us how to view ourselves, but it is actually uh, the way God understands his relationship to you and is the way he has formulated his plan for all of time. That you are an heir, meaning... He is planning on you being a part of his kingdom, and he has things for you to do. And so we are children of God, and of children we are heirs. We we will reign with Christ in his kingdom, and his plan is to give you a role in his kingdom. And and the thing is, is not all of us will have the same role. There's there's differing things that are going to happen. And and other scriptures tell us that your role in Jesus' kingdom is dependent upon your level of submission to the Holy Spirit in your life. There's reward available for those that are really uh, practicing a deeper sense of obedience and deeper fellowship with the Lord. There's great reward. But all of us are heirs. Even if you totally blow it in life, it doesn't change your sonship in God's family. And that's our great confidence and assurance that we have. And the Spirit is reminding us of that as we embrace our life of suffering for the advancement of the kingdom. So, uh, the Spirit does two things in our lives. This is the primary way He is speaking to you and I. He is, he is helping you receive God as a glad and good Father, and He is also reminding us and speaking to us that we are God's children. These are difficult truths to embrace. These are things that we struggle with for the rest of our lives, and He's calling us to a deeper sense of embracing these realities. He's reminding us of these truths, and we forget all the time. Paul has said some amazing things that fall under this concept of being a child of God so far in Romans 8. He said we have not, we're not under condemnation. We're not debtors to the flesh. He said we're indwelt by the Spirit. We belong to Christ. Our spirits are alive. We're children of God. We're adopted into his family. We're co-heirs with Christ, and we're glorified together with Christ. These are important truths because of the difficulty that we face in this world and the temptation to go back into enslavement and fear. He is just shouting these things at us in a loving, gentle, awesome, and powerful way all the time. And so the Spirit's voice ultimately is one that is forming a new way to identify yourself, to view yourself. And so here's the question. I skipped over at the beginning. We're we're coming back to it. What voices are forming the way that you view yourself? If, If this is how the Spirit is talking, then to be led by the Spirit is to search out that voice in your life. And, and we struggle with that, and so it's important to sit here and evaluate. Well, if, if the Spirit's voice is not formulating these things, what is? What kinds of things are you listening to? Whose voice is forming your identity? That's a great evaluation question. And my prayer, and I think God's heart for you is to silence those voices and increase the volume of the Spirit's voice in your life. That's a way of understanding this whole series on the Holy Spirit. I am trying to help increase the volume of the Spirit's voice in your life and in my life as well. This series is just as much for me as it is for you, probably more for me. That leads us to celebration, the discipline of celebration. Our identity is formed by what God thinks of us, what he has done for us, and what he will do for us. And so the discipline of celebration is the articulation of what God has done for us, what he is uh, going to do in us, and, and, and what he's doing right now in us. That's, that's a huge part of our celebration. So when we define this discipline and what we want to enter into this week, and you don't just do it through singing, you do it through all kinds of ways, is the discipline of celebration where you dwell on the goodness of God as shown in his goodness to us. We do that communally. We can do that individually. We have moments 
uh, in our homes, or moments with our friends, whatever it is your situation is, where we dwell on the goodness of God as shown in his goodness to us. There's a little bit of a typo. I forgot to fix it in between services. My bad. This is the point of, of the texting thing. You have a few more minutes to do that. Uh, and then we're going to enter a time of worship. Celebration is to dwell in the goodness of God as shown in his goodness to us. Now, this is hard to celebrate. And, and uh, not just because we're fuddy-duddies. But because the reality in, in our church body, in this room today, it can be hard because there's all kinds of junk going on in our lives, isn't there? There's all kinds of pain there's heartache, there's burdens, there's stress, there's all kinds of things going on. And so the question is always, how could we celebrate when there's all kinds of mess in the world? How could we celebrate when I myself am struggling with sin, or when this person is, is, has passed away, or whatever it is? There's all kinds of just hardship that we face. How can we celebrate in the midst of this awful, cruel world? How can we celebrate when we ourselves are struggling and feel far from God? This quote uh, is really helpful as we wrestle with that question. This is from Dallas Willard. He says this, and this is an articulation of why to celebrate. This is not the only reason to celebrate, but it, it helps answer this tension that we feel. The world is radically unsuited to the heart of the human person, and the suffering and terror of life will not be removed no matter how spiritual we become. That's an important truth. That no matter what we do, no matter how much we practice listening to the Holy Spirit and how much Bible we read, we will never eradicate suffering and hardship in our lives. We will never eradicate suffering and hardship on this earth. It just isn't going to happen until Jesus returns. That's unsuitable for us. That's not what we're created to be. We're not created to be in this destructive environment. So what do we do? It's because of this that a healthy faith cannot be built and maintained without heartfelt celebration of his greatness and goodness to us in the midst of our suffering and terror. It reminds us that there's something different that's going to happen one day. And it reminds us that God is living and active, and he's not just going to work one day, but he's living and active now, and he has broken into this awful, cruel world, and he is bringing his goodness. He is shining his light. He is bringing salvation and deliverance and healing. It has happened, it's happening, and it will happen in a greater way. And so what our task as Christians in the midst of all this is to make sure we engage the discipline of celebration to remember that God is living and active and that he is moving amongst us. And that's what we want to do with our service. Let me uh, put up a number of scriptures here that talk about uh, celebration as a way of motivating us, as a way of articulating this. These are verses for you to go and look up this week. I would, I would really encourage you to go, to go read these things. Deuteronomy 14 is great. It's this yearly thing where uh, each Israelite is supposed to bring their, their crops and they're supposed to bring them to the temple in Jerusalem and have a great feast and a great party as a way of thanking the Lord and celebrating a great harvest. So they don't have to sacrifice anything. They just eat everything and drink everything. And then Deuteronomy is great because it's like, and if you're too far from the temple, the journey with all that stuff, sell it where you're at, bring the cash, and when you get to Jerusalem, spend the cash on whatever your heart desires and party before the Lord. That's what it says. Celebration, in other words, is scheduled. It's not just spontaneous. It is a way to engage every year for Israel, and God had all kinds of celebrations, not just that one, that are articulated in the, in the, in the law about making sure they understand and celebrate God's goodness in the midst of the, the struggles of life. It's scheduled. It's not just spontaneous. We can schedule it. Uh, that's a reality. And Psalm 30, 11 through 12, though, gets at the more spontaneous thing that, that, that we celebrate when there's a deliverance, when there's a healing, when God somehow shows up and rescues. We celebrate that moment. Just It should be immediate. Uh, and and uh, so it, not only is it scheduled, but it also can be spontaneous. Jesus celebrates. He talks about celebration, and he, and he engages celebration all the time. I mean, he, he was called a glutton and a drunkard by the Pharisees. Did you know that? 
That's in Matthew 11. Right before he says, come to me all who are weary and I'll give you rest, they just accuse him for being a partier. And he won't even let his disciples fast. They're like, why won't you let your disciples fast? He's like, y'all, it's a wedding feast. How can you fast at a feast? And then in, in Luke 10, the, he sends out 72. They come back and they give this report, this great ministry report. And Jesus rejoices and he thanks the Father and he erupts into this prayer. In Luke 15, he says that, man, when one sinner repents, there's great rejoicing and celebration in heaven. Part of the character of God is that he celebrates over restoration and repentance. Uh, in, in verse 32 of Luke 15, that's where the, the father of the prodigal son celebrates before the son even says anything. The dad is ready to celebrate. That's supposed to teach us about the Lord. Isaiah 55, 12 is talking about the Messiah's arrival. Even the trees will clap their hands, is what Isaiah says. Even the stinking trees will celebrate. Isn't that awesome? I have no idea what that's going to sound like, but I cannot wait for trees to clap their branches. However that's going to be. And it could be just a metaphor, but the bottom line is, is that all of creation will celebrate one day. And Jesus says, even when he, he's, he's going to Jerusalem, and they're like, hey, quiet these people down. He's like, dude, the rocks are going to cry out if they don't. There's a great celebration happening. And then the final thing is we celebrate by giving testimony. Psalm 40 is great for this. It talks about a person who's experienced his great deliverance. But the, the, the celebration isn't complete with just an individual uh, thanking of God. The celebration is complete, it says, when, when he tells the congregation. When he, when he tells the assembly and we can all celebrate God together, that's an aspect of celebration that we can enter into as a community. That's why we exist in community is to help each other and to give each other reasons for celebrating in the midst of the difficulty and terror of living in this world. We need each other to celebrate and to engage this discipline of celebration. So we will uh, spend um, some time now singing two songs and during those songs we want to display uh, the things that you've texted in, uh, and uh, have a great time of celebration together. Let's stand, please, with me, and let me pray, and then we'll, we'll celebrate God's goodness together. God, we uh, are thankful to you for today. We're thankful that you've given us life and breath. All these things, Lord, that we come with in our hearts, there's great burdens, there's great grief, there's uh, pain, there's conflict, there's struggle, there's all kinds of uncertainties and unknowns that we have in our lives. We lay those at your feet now, Lord, not wanting to just forget about them, but to really surrender those things to you so that we can fully celebrate you and your character and your goodness. Spirit, would you, as we sing, would you remind us of the work that you've done in our hearts? Would you remind us of who we are in Christ? Remind us of the day that we became Christians. Remind us of the day that we were baptized. Remind us of, of the time where we truly heard your voice and we made the right decisions and you confirmed that. Remind us of those days and call us back to yourself. Lead us, Lord, to be a church full of the Holy Spirit. Lead us to be a church that really is, is turning up the volume of your voice within our own spirit. Help us to do that now as we celebrate you, Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.